Live from New York City, it's The Gary Null Show. And now, your host, Gary Null. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Null. Always a pleasure to be able to spend this time with you because it's for everyone. Every single person, no matter what your background, politics, culture, everyone deserves to live a longer and healthier and happier life. And that's the information that I share. A study from Brown University and UCLA talks about drinking hot tea every day. Why? It'll lower your glycoma risk. That's correct. Drinking a cup of hot tea, ideally non-caffeinated green tea, and you can spice it up. You can put, you know, stevia in it, one drop of stevia, 500 times sweeter than sugar, and yet it's non-caloric, it's natural, it's healthy, it's from an herb, and, but it sweetens it up. Or if you want to really go to do something more functional and medicinal, uh, half a teaspoon of Manuka honey. It is one of your most powerful healing honeys. Really is good for you. And you can also squeeze the juice of one lemon. That helps with the slightly alkalizing effect of the lemon water, which is really healthy for your joints. And also for those of you who tend to be stiff and pained in the morning, it alleviates that. So this study showed that drinking a cup of hot tea at least once a day may be linked to a significantly lower risk of developing the serious eye condition, glycoma. And that's according to this study published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. So the researchers looked at the data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in the United States. And this is a nationally representative annual survey of around 10,000 people and uh, physical examinations and blood samples. It's all designed to gauge the health and nutritional status of the U.S. adults and children. In this particular year, it also includes eye tests or glycoma. And uh, so it was just shown that that T makes a difference. Now, right now, more people are looking at decaffeinated a green tea. And that is what I would recommend. And now a study from Poznan University of Medical Sciences in Poland. This is a really good study because it's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized study. And it deals with resveratrol, R-E-S-V-E-R-A-T-R-O-L, and what it does for polycystic ovary syndrome, a very problematic system of dysfunction in the body and a lot of women suffer from it. So, uh, in fact, studies on isolated ovarian uh, theca and interstitial cells suggest that resveratrol, by the way, which is a natural polyphenol, reduces androgen production. And this study was designed to evaluate endocrine and metabolic effects of resveratrol on this condition. And uh, because it was double-blind and placebo-controlled, and randomized, uh, it made a big difference. It was over three months. Now, they took 1,500 milligrams of resveratrol a day, or a placebo, and uh, the primary outcome was the change in the serum total resveratrol treatment led to a significant decrease of total T by 23%. So I won't go into the science of it. I'll simply say, if you're one of the individuals who are suffering from a condition that is very common and very problematic, that's polycystic ovary syndrome, resveratrol at 1,500 milligrams has been proven in one of the finest scientific studies of its kind to make a huge difference. All right. Now, from Macquarie University Center for Emotional Health in the Netherlands, Encouraging risk-taking in children may reduce the prevalence of childhood anxiety. What? At a time when parents, we've gone from the soccer moms to the uh, bulldoze parents, and now the helicopter parents, generally these are parents from affluent backgrounds, more often than not from the professional class or the wealthy class. 
And unlike when you and I were growing up, where, where are you going? I'm going out to play. Okay, be back by sundown, sunset. We were, we had dinner. Nobody asked, where were you? It's like nobody cared. We were out and we were, you know, we were playing. That's what kids are supposed to do. Play, yell, scream, have fun. Have that, and then do it all over the next day. Not today. In fact, these same parents are so pushy that they've gotten laws passed that if you allow your child to walk to school on their own, unattended, you could be arrested as a parent. They want to make sure that every single second of your life is micromanaged so you don't make mistakes. As a result, we now have one full generation who's been exposed to this. Fortunately, this is not generally the case with many of the working class individuals because they're used to life as it is. They realize nothing in life is perfect, that there's the dark side and the light side of every human being. We're all capable of doing good or wrong. We're all capable of moral or immoral acts. We're all capable of being honest or lying. So based in no small measure on the quality of our, our village, our community, our neighborhood, our in-laws, our direct family, all that impacts the choices we make. But at the end, so do our peers, and so do we. And so we're all going to make wrong choices at different times in our life, which is amazing when I'm watching people today being attacked for something they wrote 30 years ago. All right? Well, are you the same person you were 30 years ago? I don't think so. We all evolve in different ways for different reasons. So should you be held to the same standards? And that's where we have to have a different type of dialogue. So here are all these very high-powered people who are the opinion leaders and sometimes the policymakers within our society dictating how we should behave. And one of the things they've done, and thank goodness that it has not impacted all children or all young adults or all millennials, is they've said, don't take risks, because then you risk losing something. And so as a result, they've been given stuff. Do you know that over half of all, all college graduates are living at home with their parents? If you didn't think that was a challenge when they were living at home, because the parents generally don't mention the sacrifice they make, and they do. I was thinking about this this morning when I was working out. And uh, because I, I get a lot of email and uh, and the ones that are more interesting are sent to me by Sharon or office or Elizabeth. And do I want to address this on the air? And if something could help a lot of people in the audience, those are the ones that I say, go ahead, let's, let's go with that. But one was about a person who says that they're now 35 they came from a professional background of both parents being professionals, but didn't mention whether they were the lawyers, doctors, engineers. And they never took risks because they didn't have to. Everything that they wanted, they were given. And every mistake that they made was taken care of by their parents. There was always an emotional safety net. So they never had to learn any lessons. Why learn anything? What's the risk to me. If I fail, I don't fail. Because if it's in class, my mom's going to be on the phone screaming at the teacher and threatening him. And that's the way a lot of, not all, but that's the way a lot of these rich, entitled, excessively aggressive parents believe that uh, life should be. Interesting, because I was doing a film once. I was down in New Orleans. And uh, it was the drug of our children a long time ago. And I was outside of a school, and I was waiting with my camera crew to go in so I could film the teachers and the children. It was on the subject of ADD and ADHD. And uh, because I didn't believe at that time that any of the evidence showed that ADD and ADHD were brain chemical imbalances unless the person had been damaged at some point in the birthing process uh, with vaccines which did cause brain chemical changes, but not always manifesting at severe levels. Sometimes it could be very severe. In any case, I'm watching, I'm watching a woman outside on the cell phone, and she's pacing back and forth and back and forth, 
and a real intense conversation. I'm waiting. So this is a person walking back in front of me and back and forth and yelling. And unbeknownst to her, her small daughter is doing the same thing. She's walking back and forth with imaginary phone up here and she's shaking her head and hands. She's, she's absorbing the behavior of her mother. And the mother was clueless about it. And how often do we become an extension of the inappropriate behavior and reasons and reactions of our parents, those around us? Epigenetically, we become everything at some level that we're exposed to. We can engage it or disengage it. We can make good choices or bad choices. And uh, so uh, this is leading to this idea that if we don't encourage children to take risks, appropriate risks, not irresponsible risks, then how will they know their own limits of creating? Of You know, once when I was a kid, we were all going out to trial for the baseball team and we all had a chance. And uh, one of my buddies, uh, a ball came out to him and he threw it. And it went way off to the side. He didn't get it back. And the coach noticed this. And he kind of had it said, it's okay. He said, we all make mistakes. Well, he never tried out again. Never. He, he, he was afraid. And we talked about this later. Why didn't you continue? I, you know, I, I felt bad that I disappointed the coach and looked stupid in front of everyone else. I said, no. All of us are going to try things we're not going to succeed at, and that's okay. Try. That's that risk-taking. I would rather try something and fail, learn the lesson of that failure, and not be afraid of taking appropriate risks than not to take any risk at all and play it safe. That's from my own background. Now, according to this study from the University Center for Emotional Health, and this, by the way, is a new international study, it suggests that parents who employ challenging parent behavior methods, uh, an active physical and verbal behaviors that encourage children to push their limits. I repeat, push your limits. Are likely protecting their children from developing childhood anxiety disorders. That's what it found. I'll bet a lot of people in here came to the different running clubs. I know because, well, look who did show up. Over 32,000 people in the New York area did the New York City Marathon at least once. And But if you were ever there, and we have photographs, you can see it for yourself. We have videos, you can see the videos. <laughs> be like a 1,000 people come on a Sunday uh, twice a year, once in the spring and once in the, in the winter to train for the next marathon. And it took us six months. The first Sunday, there would be a massive amount of people. And we would talk for about an hour and explain what makes the Natural Living Running and Walking Club different than all the other running and walking clubs. Because we don't start with elite athletes. We just start with normal people. And don't look at your body now and say, oh, I can't do it. Look at myself now. No, what you're looking at now is not you now. You're looking at everything you've done to get your body to this condition of sin, either healthy or out of shape overweight up to that point. So we're going to have a whole different discipline going forward. But you've got to push yourself. You've got to push back the boundary. You've got to get out of your comfort zone. And it's all a learning process. That's why the first hour of every Sunday in the park is about talking about life issues, not about running or walking. Now, from this, some of the greatest athletes in American history, Sid Howard, Thelma Wilson, uh, Sam Skinner, uh, and these are phenomenal. Louise Nottage. Louise Nottage was unbeaten. She'd go to the uh, Senior Olympics and win in 10 different competitions, 12 different competitions. One of the most remarkable athletes in history. They all came from that. None were elite athletes. But they became that because they pushed the limits. So when you push the limits, you're going to get an outcome. And hopefully that outcome is important to you, but it causes you to make a sacrifice because you're putting your energy into something. So what do you have to sacrifice to push limits and grow? Well, comfort's the first thing you have to sacrifice. 
getting up at four o'clock in the morning to do those long workouts. And where you, sometimes you're in pain, you got blisters, you don't always feel good, but you know that you're training as if it mattered. You're pushing the limits to see how far you can go within reason. And I'll never forget the time that we all, a bunch of us, 20 of us, were going to go do a race on Long Island. But the van that was supposed to take us all out there, a commercial van, didn't show up. So at the last moment, and we had to go to Huntington, uh, a bunch of people had cars. And so we had in one car, 12 people in one car, one not a big car. We were sitting on each other's laps, all crunched up, and we had an hour ride to go. And so when we got out there, they were lining up. We had no time to loosen up, but we had taught ourselves how to use our mind to get our body relaxed so adrenaline doesn't flow and cortisol doesn't rise. So you run relaxed. So I ran over to the uh, meet director, who I happen to know, and I said, we didn't have time to get the numbers. You know, we were delayed by over an hour and we're not even loose. Could you just delay the beginning of the race for five minutes so we can stretch? I said, okay. I said, uh, but we all have our natural living t-shirts on. So when we pass, uh, and can we then be, that will be our number. She said, sure. There are about 800 people in the race. Now we had trained to push through boundaries. So it was cold. We were out there running in zero degree weather. There was no excuse that could be accepted for not being up uh, to show up. As a result, Every single one of the people in age groups won. I mean, it was un unbearable. We were all going back from this really fast running race and uh, with our medals. And everybody was laughing because for us, it was, a, it was a party. The training was hard. The racing was easy. That's life. Preparing for life is hard. Living life should be easy. If sh you, should, you should live your life like Fred Astaire danced, smooth. And you can, but it requires a body, mind, and relationship. Don't expect everything to be easy. It's not. We're all faced with different problems, different crises, different betrayals, different discrepancies between the truth and reality. And we're all faced with making compromises. What happens when you compromise the truth? You're less for it. And then you start getting comfortable in deception. You get comfortable in not being honest. Think about that for a moment. All this goes back to the central point from this one university study. And that is that if we really want to grow, take risks in being honest. I remember once I took one last thing. I'm sorry for these little sidebars, but I think they're important. I was on WMCA radio. And there were only two big radio stations at a time in New York. WR, which was huge, and WMCA, which had a really strong audience, and they had all the heavyweights. We had Larry King live, Sally Jesse Raphael, Barry Gray, Barry Farber, Long John Neville, uh, and Candace, Candy Jones, uh, Alex Bennett, and myself. And I was the little guy in the middle of the day when no one wanted to be on it in the dead zone. One o'clock to four o'clock is in the dead zone. I was on at one o'clock. And I only had a like 1,700 quarter-hour audience to start. But at the end, I had the number one audience in America of all radio stations in the afternoon. And it all started when I was told that I can't do an interview longer than seven minutes. That's it. Now, that included the introduction, the exit, uh, a commercial. So it gives you like four minutes to talk with someone. I had Linus Pauling on. And so I let it run. And uh, the engineer kept going like this. Look at your, <laughs> you're running late, you're running late. And at the end of the interview, I was called into the owner's office. She said, can you not read a clock? I said, yes, yes, ma'am, I can. Why did you not end the interview? I said, well, it's the first time Linus Pauling has been on radio that I'm aware of in New York. And he's a great man. The only person to ever shared two unshared Nobel Prizes or win uh, two unshared Nobel Prizes. And he was talking about vitamin C, and no one's else talked about vitamin C at high doses. I thought the audience would benefit from it. I don't care what the audience wants. You're not to do that ever again. 
So I did it again. And then that was it. I, I was, for all intents and purposes, I was out of there. But she was going away for the summer. And she had such contempt for me that I wasn't even given an office. I was given a chair at the end of the little storage hallway with her filing cabinets. And a little, it was it looks like a chessboard. It was actually cardboard. And I put it on my lap and I would put all my notes on it. And that's where I would work each day. Uh, no telephone, <laughs> nothing, right? And uh, and that was fine. Because quite frankly, I just enjoyed the walk from my home on 86th Street down to uh, WMCA on 57th Street. In any case, um, I went ahead and did it when she was gone. And I did long interviews, some a half hour long. And the program director, Mark Mason, a wonderful human being. I mean, if every if every radio station had Mark Mason who would not allow the enemies out there, the meat industry, the sugar industry, to keep me off the air. He says, nope. Uh, Gary is saying things that are accurate, and we believe in this freedom of speech. As a result, I did this. And the audience girl, I wasn't paying attention to the arbitrons when we came back. She asked, I could hear, because her office right beside, behind the wall where I said, why is he still here? And Mark said, uh, you want to take a look at the ratings? And so when she left, my ratings were like 1,600. Came back, there were 60,000, number one on the whole station. And uh, suddenly that, she still didn't like me, but she didn't fire me. Now, what if I had not made in a decision to take a risk? Risk my job, but I did. And I did a lot more things taking risks. And as a result of taking those risks, I've been able as a human being to grow. And so you can't scare me because if you took away everything I own, you've taken away nothing that's important to who I am. And I think that we should realize we're more important than the stuff in our life. And think of making change to get out of your comfort zone. If we did that, then we would care about the planet. We wouldn't buy a lot of stuff we never use. We wouldn't choose to live in places that are environmentally not sustainable. We would choose to look into a person's background to see what they voted on before we voted for them. But we don't. We react instead of reason. So, those of you who are not children, and therefore this message wouldn't be important to you for the parents of children, at what age did you stop taking appropriate risks? Just saying. I'll do one more uh, comment. And uh, by the way, these are posted on Ramble, uh, Rumble and uh, Odyssey and other sites. Music therapy reduces pain and anxiety for patients with cancer and sickle cell disease. This is from the University of Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. A new study found patients with cancer and patients with sickle cell disease treated at an academic cancer center reported clinically significant reductions in pain and anxiety in response to music therapy. Furthermore, the patients who received music therapy reported significantly higher pain and anxiety at baseline than patients uh, with the hematologic and or oncological conditions. And so, you know, it's just a good study showing how important music is. Well, what about people who don't have cancer or sickle cell? How about everybody can benefit from music? And this was published in the Integrative Cancer Therapy, so leading journal focusing on understanding the science of integrative cancer treatments. Just saying, add music into your life. And it can make a difference. And most people understand that. Oh, and by the way, just for all of you who are still right up close to your cell phones and using the computers right up close for your children, the laptops, sitting with the laptop that is bringing in electromagnetic pulses to your whole reproductive system. According to Kaiser Permanente Division of Research, the study links 
health risks to electromagnetic field exposure. A study of real-world exposure to non-ionizing radiation from magnetic fields in pregnant women found a significantly higher rate of miscarriage, providing new evidence regarding their potential health risks. This was published in Journal of Scientific Reports. By the way, non-ionizing radiation from magnetic fields is produced when electric devices are in use and electricity is flowing. It can be generated by a number of environmental sources, electric appliances, your smart meters, your smart homes, power lines and transformers, wireless devices, wireless networks. So when we're exposed to the magnetic fields versus a close proximity to these sources while they're in use, that, that means that we are putting ourselves at risk of the hazards from ionizing radiation as well, and it's well established by there are over 10,000 additional studies on how we get radiation sickness, including cancer and genetic damage, and the evidence of health risks to humans from non-ionizing radiation. So that's just the latest. And by the way, I have a cell phone, an old one. It's not one of the smart ones, just one of old flip phones. And I have the extension cord that traps the electromagnetic pulses. So when I use it once a week, I use my cell phone for under a half hour a week. On one day when I go to the market, I put it out there. And so I got the phone over there and then the earplugs in here with that little tube and that vacuum tube is what absorbs it. And here, even with all the monitors I have, and I, uh, I stay at least four feet away and I have a measurement. I can actually measure the electromagnetic pulses coming at me. I'm sitting right now under my desk here is uh, the computer and my feet are about four feet away from it. Again, you can measure these things and see, are you sleeping, working near something that can cause you these problems? Not difficult. That's the latest on health and healing. I'm Gary Knoll. We're going to take a break and come right back at you. We have a lot to share today. Please stay with us. Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. <laughs> 